Chapter Twenty Seven of *The Empty Sack* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty Seven. Teddy was not called on to face a bunch of men till going to the courtroom for his trial. Dressed long before the hour in a new dark blue suit, fresh linen, and a dark blue tie, his prison pallor, a little like that of death, put him out of the list of the active and free. As he sat on the edge of his bunk, sombre with dread, he was nevertheless obliged to find suitable jocosities with which to answer the good-luck wishes that came slithering along the walls from the neighbouring cells. It was half-past nine before two guards, whom he had never seen before, stalwart fellows, well over six feet, came to the door and unlocked it. "'Ready, Folly. Time's come.' Springing to his feet, he found handcuffs slipped round his wrists, before he was aware of what was being done. It was an unexpected indignity. He had never been handcuffed before. "'Say, fellows,' he protested, "'I'll go all right. I don't want these on me.' "'Come along with ye.' The words were friendly rather than rough, as was also the hand of a guard on each shoulder as they steered him along the corridor. The brig is a rambling building, or succession of buildings, with courthouse and house of detention under the same series of roofs. The pilgrimage was long, upstairs, downstairs, through passages, past offices, past courtrooms, with guards, police, clerks, lawyers, litigants, loungers, standing about everywhere. The sight of a man in handcuffs arrested all eyes for the moment, and stilled all tongues. With his glances flying from right to left and from left to right, Teddy again began to feel the sense of separation from the human race which had struck to his soul that day on the marshes. Of his other impressions, the chief was that of squalor. It seemed as if all the elements had been brought together that would make poor justice vulgar and unimpressive. Out of a squalid cell he had been pushed along squalid hallways, through groups of squalid faces into a squalid courtroom, where he was ushered into a squalid cave, long and narrow, with a seat hardly wider than a knife-blade. Once within the cage the handcuffs were taken off, the door was locked, and each of the stalwart guards took his stand at one end. The cage being raised some six or eight inches above the level of the floor, the boy was well in sight of every one. It was like being on a throne, or a calvary. On taking his seat he was vaguely conscious of a bank of faces, tier above tier, at the back of the courtroom. Before him some fifteen or twenty officials, reporters and lawyers lolled at their tables, walked about, yawned, picked their teeth, or told anecdotes that raised a smothered laugh. Most of them struck him as untidily dressed. Few looked intelligent. Among them a portly man, whom he afterwards saw as the district attorney, in a cutaway coat, with a line of pique at the opening of his waistcoat, seemed like a person in fancy costume. Everyone paused as he entered the cage, but, at last having satisfied their curiosity, they paid him no further attention. The trial lasted three days, passing before his eyes like a motion-picture film of which he was only a spectator. Try as he would, he found it hard to believe that the proceedings had anything to do with him. All this fuss, he would comment to himself grimly, to get the right to kill a man. The strain of being under so many cruel or indifferent eyes sent him back with relief to his cell, where during the nights he slept soundly. His one bit of surprise came from Stenhouse's final argument in his defence. Up to that point both defence and prosecution had struck him as more or less silly. The State had tried to prove him a desperado whom it was dangerous to let live. The defence had done its best to show him a youth of arrested intelligence, not responsible for his acts. He grinned inwardly when Jenny, Gussie, and half a dozen of his old chums testified to foolish pranks, forgotten or half-forgotten by himself, in the hope of convincing the court that he had never had the normal sense. But Stenhouse, in his concluding speech, transcended all that, taking Teddy's own stand as the only one which offered the ghost of a chance of acquittal. He began his final appeal quietly, in a tone little more than colloquial. There's an old saying, a variant on something said by Benjamin Franklin, which we might remember oftener than we do. It's terse, pithy, humorous, wise. Someone has called it the finest bit of free verse composed in the eighteenth century. Listen to it. 
It is hard to make an empty sack stand upright. So it is. The empty sack collapses of its own accord. It can't do anything but collapse. It was not meant to stand upright. To demand that it shall stand upright is to insist on the impossible. A full sack will stand as solid as a tree. A group of full sacks will support one another. Put the empty sack among them, and from the very law of gravitation it will go down helplessly. Now, gentlemen of the jury, you are being asked to bring in a verdict against the empty sack, the sack that has been carefully kept empty, because it hasn't the strength and stability of that which all the coffers of the country have combined to fill. With this as a text, Stenhouse draw a picture of the industrious man who is limited by the very nature of his industry. He is not limited by his own desire, but by the use society wishes to make of him. Serving a turn, he is schooled to serve that turn, and to serve no other turn. This schooling takes him unawares. He doesn't know it has begun, before waking to find himself drilled to a system from which only a giant can escape. Few men being giants, the average man plods on, because he doesn't know what else to do. There is rarely anything else for him to do. Having taken the first ill-paid job that comes his way, he hasn't meant to give himself to it all his life. He dreams of something bigger, more brilliant, more productive. The boy who runs errands sees himself a merchant. The lad who becomes a clerk looks forward to being a partner. The young man who enters a bank is sure that some day he will be bank president. Sometimes, gentlemen, these early visions work out to a reality. But in the vast majority of cases, the youth, before he ceases to be a youth, finds himself where the horse is when he has once submitted to the bridle. He can go only as he is driven. Life is organised not to let him go in any other way. Needing him for a certain purpose, it keeps him to that purpose. Work, taken as a great corporate thing, is made up of hundreds of millions of tiny tasks, each of which calls for a man. The man being found, he must be trimmed to the size of his task. Stenhouse had no quarrel with methods universally followed by civilised man. To criticise them was not his intention, as it was not his intention to complain, because man had not yet brought in the golden age. But I do claim that the smaller the task to which a man is nailed down, and the smaller the pay he is able to earn, the greater the responsibility of collective society toward that individual. There was a time, he declared, when much has been said to the discredit of slavery, but one thing could be urged in its favour. The man who had been kept throughout his life to one small job was not thrown out in his old age to provide for himself as he could. Having worked for society, as society was constituted then, Society recognised at least the duty of taking care of him. Stenhouse disclaimed any comparison between free American labour and a servile condition. He was striving only for a principle. Men couldn't be screwed down during all their working lives to the lowest wage on which body and soul could be kept together, and then be judged by the same standards as those who had had opportunity to make provision for themselves and their families. The same interpretation of the law couldn't be made to cover the cases of the full sack and the empty one. And yet, he went on, changing his tone with his theme, the empty sack is of value because it can be filled. Coarse, cheap, negligible as it seems, it is much too good to throw away. It is an asset to production, to the country's trade, to the whole world's wealth. And, gentlemen, what shall we say when we call that empty sack a man? The value of the human asset was the next point to which he led his listeners. It is only a truism to say that among all the precious things with which the Almighty has blessed his creation, the most precious is a human life. And yet we lived in a world which seems to believe this so little that we must sometimes remind ourselves that it is so. Within a few years we have seen millions of men reckoned merely as stuff. As productive assets to the race they haven't counted. We could read of a day's loss at the battlefield running up into the thousands and never turn a hair. We came to regard a young man's life as primarily a thing to throw away. It is for this reason, gentlemen of the jury, that I venture to remind you that a young man's life is primarily a thing to save. 
It may be a truism to say that a human life is the most precious of all created things, but it is a truism of which we are only now, to our bitter and incalculable cost, beginning to realise the truth. He went on to draw a picture of the contributions to the general good made by the Follets, father and son. Their work had been humble, but it had been essential. Essential work, faithfully performed, should guarantee an old age protected against penury. He reminded his hearers that he was not opposed to the law of supply and demand, which was the only known method by which the business of the world could be carried on. He only pleaded for the same humanity to a man as was shown to a broken-down old horse. From his one interview with Lizzie, Stenhouse had got what he called the good line. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out of the corn. Of this he now made use, following it up with St. Paul's explanation. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth may plough in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Gentlemen, so long as we live in a society in which the vast majority of us can never be partakers of the hope with which we started out, so long must justice take account of the suffering of the poor muzzled brute that treadeth out the corn. If he go frenzied and runs amuck, he cannot be judged by the standards which apply to him who has been left unmuzzled and free to satisfy his wants. It is not fair. It is not human. It is true that to protect your own interests you have the power to shoot him down. But when he lies dead at your feet, no more muzzled in death than he was in life, there is surely somewhere in the universe an avenging force that is on his side, and which will make you, you as representatives of the society which has placed its action in your hands, and you as twelve private individuals with duties and consciences, there is somewhere in the universe this avenging force which will require his blood at your hands and make you pay the penalty. Surely you can find a better use for that valuable asset, a young man's life, than just to take it away. For the sake of the public whose honour is in your keeping, you must play the game squarely. For the sake of your own future peace of mind, you must not add your own crime to this poor boy's misfortune. Your duty at this minute is not merely to interpret the dead letter of a law. It is to be the voice of the people whom you represent. Remember, that by the verdict you bring in, that people will be committed to the most destructive of all destructive acts, or it will get expression for that deep human common sense which transcends written phrases to act in the spirit of the greatest of us all, judging not according to the appearance, not according to the appearance, gentlemen, and you remember who counselled that, but judging righteous judgment. He fell back into his seat, exhausted. He was so impressive and impassioned as to convince many of his hearers that he believed his own plea, which to some who had considered the verdict a certainty, it was now in doubt. Among Teddy's friends a hope arose, that in spite of all expectation to the contrary, he might be saved. Bob looked over and smiled. Teddy smiled back, but mainly because he rejoiced in what he felt to be his justification. He couldn't see how they could convict him after such a setting forth as that, though for the consequences of acquittal he had so little heart. In the excitement of the courtroom, the judge's voice, when he began to give the jury their instructions, fell like cool, quiet rain on thunderous sultriness. He was a small man, with a leathery, unemotional face, framed by an iron-grey wig of faultless side-parting, and long, straight, unnaturally smooth hair. He had the faculty of seeming attentive without being influenced listening, reasoning, asking a question, or settling a disputed point, he gave the impression of having reduced intelligence to the soulless accuracy of a cash register. He reminded the jury that the law was not on trial, society was not on trial. The industrial experience of one Josiah Follett was not a feature in the case. They must not allow the issue to be confused by the social arguments which befogged so many of the questions of the day. It was quite possible that the world was not as perfect as it might be. It was even possible that the law was not the most perfect law that could be passed. But those were considerations into which they could not enter. 
in merely approaching them, they would lose their way. The law, as it stands, is the voice of the people as it is. And the only questions before them were, first, whether or not the accused had broken that law, and, second, if he had broken it, to what degree. In answering these questions, they must limit themselves to the bare facts of the charge. With the prisoner's temptations, they had nothing to do, except in so far as they tended to create intent. The consequences to his person, whether in the way of liberty or of the last penalty, were no concern of others. Justice in itself, viewed as justice in the abstract, was no concern of theirs. They were not, however, to burden their consciences with the fear that the accused was thus deprived of protection. The duty of a jury was not protection, but discernment. The administration of the law was far too big and complex a thing for any one body of men to deal with. Justice, having many aspects, the law had as many departments. Protection was in other hands than theirs. The application of justice, pure and simple, involving punishment for guilt without excluding pity for the provocation, was duly guaranteed by the methods of the State. They would find their task simplified by dismissing all such hesitations from their minds and confining themselves to the definite question which he repeated. Had the prisoner at the bar broken the existing law, and if he had so broken it, to what degree? Having explained the difference between manslaughter and murder, as well as between first-degree murder and second, he admitted that, in case the accused was found guilty, there was much to indicate the second degree rather than the first. There was, however, one damning fact. The hand that had shot Peter Flynn went on at once to shoot William Jackman. The killing of one man might have been an accident. If not an accident, it might still have mitigating features. But for the murderer of a first man to proceed at once to become the murderer of a second indicated a planned and deliberate intent. When the court had adjourned and the jury had retired to consider their verdict, one of the guards unlocked the cage and Teddy was taken down by a corkscrew staircase to a room immediately below. It was a small room, lighted by one feeble bulb and aired from an air shaft. A table and two chairs stood in the middle of the room. A shiny, well-worn bench was fixed to one of the walls. The guards took the chairs. Teddy sat down on the bench. One of the guards cut off a piece of tobacco and put it in his mouth. The other lighted a cheap cigar. Taking another from an upper waistcoat pocket, he held it out toward Teddy. "'Have a smoke, young fellow. Teddy shook his head. He was hardly aware of being addressed. Nothing else was said to him, and the guards, almost silently, began a game of cards. This waiting with prisoners for verdicts was always a tedious affair, and one to be got through patiently. To Teddy it was not so much tedious as it was unreal. He sat with arms folded, his head sunk, and the foot of the leg which was thrown across the other leg kicking outward mechanically. Except for a rare grunted remark between the players, there was no sound but the slap of the cards on the table and the scooping in of the tricks. After nearly half an hour the door opened, and Bob Collingham came in with a basket containing sandwiches and a thermos bottle of hot coffee. With a word of explanation to the guards, he was allowed to take his seat beside the prisoner. "'Hello, old sport. Must be relieved that it's soon going to be over. Bought you something to eat?' With this introduction, they took up commonplace ground, as if it was a commonplace occasion. Teddy asked after his mother and sisters. Bob gave him the family news. Of the trial, they said nothing. Of what they were waiting for, no more was said than that Bob had persuaded Jenny and Gussie to go home promising to come and tell them the decision. Lizzie and Gladys had not appeared in the courtroom at all. Of all this Teddy approved as he munched his sandwiches stolidly. The supply of food and coffee being large, they invited the guards to share with them. The invitation was accepted, the officers suspending their game. The talk became friendly, commenting on the judge's wig and the glass eye of the foreman of the jury, but not touching directly on the trial. 
These subjects, as well as the supply of sandwiches, exhausted, the guards returned to their game, the two young men being left to themselves. For the most part they sat in silence, a silence as nearly cheerful as the circumstances permitted. "'Don't worry about me, Bob,' Teddy murmured once. "'I'm not going to care much, whichever way it is. "'Honest to God, I don't say I wouldn't like it if they sent me back home, but if they don't—' Allowing his companion to finish the sentence for himself, he lapsed into silence again. Another time, speaking as if subterranean thought came for a moment to the surface, he said, "'I like what you said about hardness and pluck. I've been practising away on them both, making myself tough inside. Funny how you can, isn't it? You think at first that because you're soft you've got to be soft, but you find out that you're just what you'd like to make yourself. That's a great line, Bob.' Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You watch, he added with a tremulous smile, and you'll see me doing it. All right, old boy, I'll watch, but we'll all be doing it with you. We're practising too. Jenny and the girls are regular bricks, and of course your mother. He smiled again. Good old Ma, she sure is the best ever. I'd be sorry for her that I am if I didn't feel certain that if, that if I go, she won't wait long after me. He swung away from this aspect of his thought to a new one. "'Say, Bob, do you suppose it's a sign that God really is with me, gump as I am, that he sent you to take Ma and the girls off my hands, you know, and make my mind easy?' They discussed those happenings which might reasonably be held to be signs of divine good intention, after which silence fell again. The guards grunted or yawned, the cards were slapped on the table, the tricks were pulled in with a scratching of paper against wood. An hour went by, another hour, and then another. In spite of his efforts to make himself hard, Teddy felt the tension. Having accidentally touched Bob's hand, he grasped it with a clutch like a vice. He was still clutching it when a messenger came to the door to say that the jury was about to render their verdict and the prisoner must come back into court. Bob climbed the corkscrew first. A guard followed him, then Teddy, then the other guard. It was after seven in the evening. The courtroom, relatively empty, had a sickly look under crude electric lighting. But half of the spectators had come back, and only those officials and lawyers who were obliged to be in their places. All the reporters were there, watching for every shade in Teddy's face, and seeing more than he expressed. Bob managed to pass in front of the cage. "'Remember, Teddy, hardness is the big word.' "'Sure thing,' Teddy whispered back. The jury filed in. The judge took his place. Teddy was ordered to stand up. He stood very straight, his hands in the pockets of his jacket. In all that met the eye, he was a sturdy, stocky young man, pleasing to look at, and with no suggestion of the criminal.' His face was grave, with a gravity beyond that of death, but he showed no sign of nervousness. If anyone showed nervousness, it was the foreman of the jury, a good-natured fish-dealer with a drooping reddish moustache, who had never expected to be in this situation. When asked if the jury had arrived at a verdict, his voice trembled as he answered, we, "'We have.' "'What is your verdict?' "'We find the accused guilty of murder.' "'Of murder in the first or the second degree?' "'In the first. That was all. Bob wheeled round toward Teddy, who smiled courageously. "'It's all right, Bob,' he whispered, as their hands met over the rail of the cage. "'I've got the right line on it. It's my medicine, and I know how to take it. Keep Ma and the girls from worrying, and I can go straight through with it.' It was all there was time for. They had not noticed that Stenhouse had said something about appeal, and the judge something about sentence. Everyone was leaving. Stenhouse came to shake hands with his client and tell him that the game wasn't up yet. The boy thanked him. The cage was unlocked, and once more Teddy, with a guard in front and a guard following after him, went down the corkscrew stair. End of chapter 1
End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 28 What I don't understand, Bob, Collingham said with faint indignation in his tone, is whether you're a married man or not. I'm a married man, father, all right. Then why don't you live like a married man? I suppose you know that people are saying all sorts of things. Bob considered the simplest way in which to put his case. It was the afternoon of the day following the end of Teddy's trial, and his father was giving him a lift homeward from the bank. It being winter, dark was already closing in, and though they were out of the city, great arc-lights were still strung along the roadways, which were otherwise lighted by flashes from hundreds of motor-cars. "'I have never said anything about this before,' the father resumed, before Bob had found the right words. "'Because we're all agreed—' your mother, Edith, and myself, that we wouldn't hamper you with questions about it while you were busy with something else. But now that's all over. Part of it is over, but only part of it. We've a long road to travel yet. If the appeal is denied, as I expect it will be, you'll have to let me in on the application to the Governor for clemency. I think I'd have some influence there. Thanks, Dad. That'd be a help. He asked after further thinking. Should you like me to live as a married man? "'considering who it is I've married?' "'Knowing that the question was a searching one, "'Bob found the reply much what he expected. "'I want to see the best thing come out of a mixed-up situation. "'I don't deny that all these problems bother me, "'but we have them on our hands, and so there's no more to be said. "'We've got to find the wise thing to do, and do it. "'That's all I'm after. "'That's all I'm after myself, Dad.' "'I don't admit any responsibility for all this muss,' Collium declared, as if his son had accused him. "'I don't care what anyone thinks. My conscience is clear. "'Of course, Dad, of course. "'But such things have happened as they have. "'I'd like to make them as easy as I can for everyone. "'And whatever money can do—' "'Or recognition?' "'They came back to the original question. "'Yes, recognition, too, as soon as we've anybody to recognise. "'What I don't understand is all this backing and filling. "'Have you asked Mother?' "'In a way, and she's just as mysterious as you.' "'Bob tried another avenue. "'You saw Jenny yourself, didn't you?' "'Once, yes.' "'What did you think of her?' "'What any man would think of her. "'She was very charming and, and appealing.' "'Did you think anything else?' "'The father turned sharply. "'What makes you ask?' "'because it's possible you did.' "'Well, I did. What of it?' "'Only this, that that's the thing I want to nail "'before I bring her to you as my wife. "'Then why don't you go to work and nail it?' "'He found the words he was in search of. "'Partly because I've other things to do, "'partly because I feel that, by giving it its time, "'it will nail itself, "'and most of all for the reason that neither she nor I "'want to take the—' the great happiness which we feel is coming to us in the end, while, while all this other thing is in the air. I wonder if you understand me. More or less. It's as if we'd accidentally put the cart of marriage before the horse of engagement. Do you see? Nominally, we're married, but really, we're only engaged. We can't be married, we don't want to be married, till other things are off our minds. With this bit of explanation— the Collinghams began to live once more, as if nothing had occurred. It was not easy, but by dint of skimming on the surface they were able to manage it. That is to say, Bob came and went, and they asked him no more questions, while on his part he continued to nerve Teddy and his sisters for another test. If there was anyone noticeably different, it was Junior. Always quick to tack according to the wind, she seemed almost to have changed her course. In putting the best face on Edith's marriage and Bob's complications, she had adopted the new ideals that kept her in the movement. "'It's the war,' she explained to her intimate. "'We're all different. Life of his used to live it begins to seem so empty. We weren't real. We people who spent our time entertaining and being entertained. It's all very well to say that we've much the same since the war as we were before, but it isn't so. I know I'm not.' 
I am quite a revolutionist. I may not have made much progress, but I am certainly more in touch with reality. With this transition, it became natural to speak of her son-in-law. Such a wonderful fellow! All mind, you know, but the type that helps so many of us to find our way through the mists of materialism and selfishness, out to the great big ends. To me, it's like a new life just to hear him talk and I can't help feeling it's providential that he's found a wife like Edith. She's an extraordinary girl to be my child, intellectual and practical at once. She can keep her husband company in all his researches, and yet cook him a good dinner if their little maid is out. Is there anything so astonishing in life as our own children and what they turn out to be? This was a transition, too, leading her to speak of Bob's affairs in the tone of one who though puzzled, takes them sympathetically. And yet I think it's enlarging. Though we've kept only on the outer edge of the drama through which Bob has been going with the girl he's married, the whole thing has deepened his life so much that it couldn't help deepening ours. It's broadened us too, I think, giving us an insight into lives so different from our own. That's what we need so much, it seems to me, that kind of broadening. It's going to solve a lot of our national problems, which at present seem to be insoluble. Yes, Bob is still at home with us, and I tell you frankly that I don't know what is coming out of it. It's all so queer and independent and modern. I'm old-fashioned, and I don't pretend to see through these young people's ways. But I'm Bob's mother, and through all his developments, and he is developing, I'm going with him. So Julia talked and talked so much that she was in danger of talking herself round. The instinct to be in the front line of fashion and something to do with it, but self-persuasion had more. The thing of the hour being the throwing over of the old social code, Junior couldn't have been Junior if she hadn't done it. But even so, the creeping in of compunction toward Bob took her by surprise. She had told herself hitherto that she loved him so much that she would work for his permanent happiness even at the cost of his temporary pain. But now she began to fear that what had seemed to her his temporary pain might prove the very life of his life. She came to this perception through reading in the newspapers the account of the Follett boy's trial. By the tacit convention which the Colliams had established that they had nothing to do with it, she never spoke of it to Bradley or Edith, nor did they speak of it to her. But she kept herself informed, and knew the devotion with which Bob gave himself to Jenny and her family. The boy's condemnation hit her hard. When Bradley came home that night, she, she saw that it had also hit him. "'I'm worth about five million dollars at a guess,' he confided to her, "'and I'd cheerfully have given four of them if this thing hadn't happened.' "'But, Bradley, dear, you had nothing to do with it.' "'I know I hadn't,' he declared savagely. "'And yet I, I do as I say.' "'But it wasn't Bradley she was most sorry for, "'nor was it for the Follett boy. "'She was sorry that, because of conditions which she herself had fostered, "'Bob would never reap the fruit of a love in which she had been so chivalrous. "'She didn't see how he could. "'Just as there was a natural Bradley and a standardised one, so there was a natural and a standardised junior. The natural junior had long seemed dead, but the bigness of the love which she saw daily and hourly exemplified moved her to the painful stirrings of a new life. Meanwhile, Bob went with Teddy up the remaining steps by which he mounted his cavalry. He stood near the cage on the morning when the boy was brought up for sentence, witnessing his coolness. On being asked if he had anything to say before sentence was pronounced, he replied, "'Nothing, sir, except to thank you for giving me such a fair trial.' The words were spoken in a firmer voice than those which followed. "'The court, in consideration of your crime of murder in the first degree, sentences you to the punishment of death by the passage of a current of electricity through your body within the week beginning.' When the appeal for a new trial was denied, it was Bob who informed Teddy. When all efforts to obtain executive clemency had failed, it was Bob again who broke the news. When the boy requested that his mother and sisters should omit their next visit to Bitterwell, 
should wait till he sent them word before coming again. It was Bob who conveyed the request. Bitterwell, the great penitentiary, was twenty miles from Pemberton Heights, and through the winter they had gone to see him some thirty-odd times. They went in couples, Gladys and her mother, Jenny and Gussie, keeping each other company. The visits were less difficult than might have been expected, because of Teddy's cheerfulness. Of the request to wait before coming again, they didn't at first seize the significance. While frank with them about everything else, Bob had never given them the date of the week the judge had named, nor had they asked for it. If they did so ask, he meant to, to tell them, but they seemed to divine his intention. Perhaps they divined the intention in this intimation from Teddy. At any rate, they didn't question it, or rebel against it. It followed on visits first of one pair, and then of the other, both of which had been so normal as almost to pass as gay. That is, Teddy's spirits had infected theirs, and they had parted from him smiling. That of Jenny and Gussie had been the first of the two, and he had sent them off with a joke. "'My boy, I am proud of you,' had been Lizzie's farewell words to him. "'Walk firmly, with your head erect, and never, never be sorry for anything you've done.' "'Good old Ma, the best ever. I sure am proud of you. What will you bet that we don't have some good times together yet?' A psychologist would have said that by suggestion and auto-suggestion they strengthened each other and themselves. But whatever the process, the result was evident. Bob had given them the verb to carry on, so that carrying on became at once an objective and a driving force. Gussie and Gladys went regularly to work. Jenny took care of the house and her mother. The latter task had become the more imperative, for the reason that, after Teddy's request that they should suspend their visits, she began to fail. It was not that she was hurt by it, but rather that she took it as a signal. In the efforts to be strong, they were helped by the fact that, not long after Teddy's removal to Bitterwell, Edith Ailing had come to see them, all of her own initiative. She had repeated the visit many times, and had Gussie and Gladys go to see her at Cathedral Heights. Jenny, had never been able to leave home. "'I didn't say anything about it to you,' Edith explained to Bob, after the occasion of her breaking the ice, "'because I wanted to do it on my own. Quite apart from you and Jenny, I feel that our lots have become involved, and that we Collingham's have some responsibility. I don't say responsibility for what, because I don't know, and yet I feel—' Unable to say what she felt, she alluded to the personal— "'Jenny, I don't get at. She's so silent, so shut away. The mother has never been well enough to see me. But the two younger girls I'm really getting to know very well, and to be very fond of. They're intelligent right down to the fingertips, and with a little guidance I'm sure they could do big things.' "'What kind of things?' "'I should train Gladys along intellectual lines, and Gussie was born for the stage. I know that Ernest and I could help them, if you thought it all right, and we should love doing it. You must read what he says in his new book, Salvage, as to getting people into the tasks for which they are fitted, and in which they can be happy. He thinks that a lot of our non-productiveness comes from the people who love doing one thing being compelled to do another, and that if we could only help the individuals we come across to find their natural jobs. It was Edith also who unconsciously helped her mother out of the trap in which she had found herself caught. Oh, by the way, whom do you think I met in the street the other day? no less a person than Hubert Ray, just back from California. And that reminds me, he told me you had bought his big picture that everyone was talking about last year. Where is it? Why did you never say anything about it? Edith was spending a day in May at Collingham Lodge, and was walking with her mother between rows of irises. Come in, Jeanie said. I'll show you. Then you'll understand. But not till life and death had been drawn from his hiding-place and propped against the wall, was Edith allowed to enter her mother's room. She advanced slowly, her eyes on the canvas. Junior waited for the shock. "'So that's it,' Edith said at last. "'It isn't a thing I should want to live and die with. I never can understand that fancy people have for nudes, but I see it's very fine.' 
"'And is this all you see?' "'All I see? Well, I see it has a meaning, of course, but—' Junior's throat felt dry. "'Don't you—don't you, you recognise anybody?' "'Who? The brass-head woman? I shouldn't know her from Eve.' Junior crept nearer. "'The brass-head woman? Who's she? What are you talking about?' "'Why, the model who sat for it. Hubert told me all about her. He said she wasn't his ideal for the part. Rather a poor lot as a woman. But he couldn't get anyone better.' She added, on examining the features, "'I don't think she's bad, considering what he wanted. Doesn't she—doesn't she remind you of, of Bob's wife?' "'About as much as she does of you. "'Surely that's not the reason why you hid the thing away. "'I I did think I, I, I was afraid that people might see a resemblance.' "'Edith made an inarticulate sound intended for derision. "'As a matter of fact, Hubert said it was probably a good thing "'for him to be obliged to paint someone else than Jenny. "'He'd been painting her so much that he was in danger of painting her into everything, "'like Andrea del Sarte with his wife.' "'Then you—' "'You don't think that he's painted her in here?' "'Edith looked again. "'Well, if you put it that way, "'and you were crazy to find a likeness, "'perhaps about the brows and down here "'at the curve of the cheek and neck. "'But no, not really. "'This is a carnal woman, "'and Jenny's a thing of the spirit.' "'She dismissed the subject as of no further importance. "'Do tell me, is there anyone in New York "'who read lazes these English chintzes?' So Junior made new plans, waiting for Bob to come home to dinner in order to meet him on the threshold, throw her arms about his neck, and give him the glad facts. But Bob sent a telephone message that he would not be home to dinner, that he would not be home that night. No one was to worry, and he would turn up at breakfast in the morning. It was all the information he gave, because, by special permission from the warden, and, under a solemn promise not to convey anything to the prisoner that would enable him to cheat the law, he was spending the night at Bitterwell. He was spending it in a low, one-storey building some sixty feet long, and not more than twenty in width. His arrangements were simple. On entering, you came into a corridor some six feet wide, running the length of seven little rooms. The seven little rooms were each furnished with a cot, a fixed wash-basin, a table, and a chair. Each had, however, this peculiarity, that the end, towards the corridor, had no wall. Instead of a wall it had long, strong, perpendicular white bars, some two or three inches apart, and running from ceiling to floor. The inmate was thus visible at all times, like an animal in a cage. In the corridor were half a dozen chairs of the kitchen variety, and at the end a little yellow door. The little yellow door led into a room of which the chief piece of furniture was a chair vaguely suggestive as of an armchair in a smoking-room, though with some singular attachments. Around it in a semicircle were some eight or ten other chairs similar to those in the corridor. In one corner was a walled-off space that might have housed a dynamo, in the other a stack of brooms and mops. As a passageway gave access to this room, and the yellow door was carefully kept closed. Bob was not required to see within. Of the seven little rooms, four were empty, and three had occupants. At one end was a negro, at the other an Italian. Teddy was in the centre. Outside there was a guard for the Italian, another for the negro, while for Teddy there were two. They were big, husky fellows, three Irishmen and a Swede, genial, good-natured souls, to whom their duties had become a matter of course. There was something of the matter of course in the whole situation, even to Teddy and Bob. The human mind, being ready to accept anything to which it is led by steps sufficiently graded, both young men were attuned to finding themselves as they were. As they were meant that Teddy clung to one of the bars from within, and Bob to the same bar from without. They talked through the open spaces, being able to do it quietly, because they were so close. "'You don't think I'm afraid, do you, Bob? I should have been afraid if it hadn't been for you. You've bucked me up something. Well, there are no words for it.' "'Let it go without words, Teddy. Don't try to say it.' "'I'd like to say it,' he grinned. "'Or rather, I'd like to say it if I could. 
I like trying to say it even when I can't. That was all for the time. But after some minutes, Teddy's hand stole over Bob's big paw as it held to the bar, so that they held to it together. It was Bob who broke the silence next. I didn't tell you, Teddy. I've only just found it out. The dad's been taken care of Mrs. Flynn and her kiddies and means to go on doing it. That's good, the boy sighed. It takes about the last thing off my mind. So they talked spasmodically, never saying much, and yet saying all the things for which language has no words. At intervals the Italian showed his sympathy by groaning heavily, which was generally a signal for the negro to begin singing, in a cottony voice, the first verse of Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Teddy apologised for them, as a host for unseemly members of his household. They're good guys, all right. That's just their way of letting me know they feel for me. It's funny how kind-hearted some mutt will be who's committed a cold-blooded murder. He had probably been following this train of thought for some minutes, when he said, in a reasoning tone, "'What can the law do with fellows of our sort? "'Look at the thing straight now. "'We've got good in us, of course, "'but you can't trust us to hold our horses. "'I don't blame them for what they're giving me, hardly any. "'Only I'll be darned if it doesn't make me sure "'that all this is only an experiment, "'a way of finding out how not to do it, "'so that we can make the next go a better one.' They discussed this topic in a desultory way, not so much letting it drop as pursuing it each in his own thought. Teddy picked up the line again after an interval of time, and some distance farther on. "'I suppose you can't believe that you've come to a place where you know you're through, and are in a hurry to get on?' "'Well, you do. I guess old people like Ma reach there, anyhow. Young people, too, when they're, when they're like me.' I've had my shot, and I've miffed it. Now I'm all on edge to have another try. I'm so crazy about that, that the thing that's to happen first doesn't seem anything very much. The hours wore on, but it seemed to Bob a night to which there was no time. Though the support he brought to Teddy was merely that of companionship, he felt that the boy was outstripping him. In Teddy's own phrase he was moving on but moving on very fast. Bob couldn't tell how he knew this. He only felt himself being left behind. Teddy was quite right. His old experiment was over, and some of the exultation of the new one was already breaking through. That was the meaning of his silences, his abstractions. That was why he came out of each such spell with a smile that grew more luminous. The Italian and the Negro fell asleep. The four guards talked less to one another. Clutching the bar grew tiring. Brannigan, one of Teddy's guards, brought up a chair, offering it to Bob. "'Why don't you sit down? It'll be quite a while yet.' Bob took the chair, Teddy the one inside the cell. Bringing it as close to the bars as possible, he thrust his fingers through the opening to touch Bob's hand. Bob closed the fingers within his palm, and so held them. "'I'm not going to send any message to Ma and the girls. They know I love them. You can't add anything to that.' A sidelong smile stole through the bars. "'I love you too, Bob. I guess it's a bum thing to say, but tonight, well, it's different, and I'm going to say it. I can't do anything to thank you. But it may mean something to you to have me loving you, like the devil, all the way from from over there? It means something to me now. Then that's all right. The Italian breathed heavily. The negro snored. The guards were bored and somnolent. Teddy might have been asleep except for the look and the smile that every now and then crept through the bars towards his companion. Suddenly he pulled his fingers from Bob's clasp jumped to his feet, and held out his arms. "'All right, Ma, I'm ready.' The cry was so loud and joyous that Bob sprang up. Brannigan lumbered forward. "'Been dreaming,' he explained, "'just as well as he has.' Teddy looked about him in bewilderment. "'No, I haven't been,' 
I wasn't asleep. I was wide awake. I guess you think I'm dippy, Bob. But I did see Ma. Pon my soul, I did. She was right there. He pointed to the spot. She looked lovely, too, young-like, and yet it was Ma all right. She wanted me to come. That's why I jumped. Ah, oh, well, perhaps I am dippy. But it's funny, isn't it? He was so preoccupied with this happening as not to notice sounds in the outer passage and beyond the yellow door. Even when he did, it was with no more than a partial cognizance. "'Listen,' he said once, "'there they are. It'll be only a few minutes now. I'm not going to let you go in there, Bob. Funny about Ma, isn't it?' The sounds grew louder. The guards were moving about. Behind the yellow door people seemed to enter. There was a scraping of chairs as they sat down. The Italian woke and howled dismally. The negro shouted his hymn. Teddy was far away on the wings of speculation. But he came back to say, "'If Ma had gone ahead of me, I know she'd like nothing better than to come and give me a lift over. But she hasn't gone ahead of me. She's over there in Indiana Avenue. That's the funny part of it. What do you suppose it means?' Bob didn't know. Neither had he time to offer an opinion— because the main door opened and the warden appeared, accompanied by the chaplain, the doctor, the principal keeper, and three other men whom Teddy didn't know. "'Here they are,' Teddy whispered, as if their coming was a relief. The warden advanced to the central cell. The door was unlocked. Teddy stood on the threshold. "'Thank you, warden. I suppose I can say good-bye to my friend.' Permission was given. Teddy stepped out into the corridor. "'You'd better go now, Bob. No use in your staying any longer.' He nodded towards the men standing round him. "'They'll handle me gently. I'm not afraid.' Their hands clasped, but the boy was only a boy, loving and in need of love. Before Bob knew what was happening, Teddy's arms were about his neck in a long, desperate embrace. A gulp that was almost a sob from each. And it was over. "'All right, boys, I'm ready. Go to it.' The words were spoken steadily. Bob limped toward the door. A guard unlocked it. "'Say, Bob!' It was Teddy's voice again. Bob turned. The lad had taken off his collar, no more conscious of the act than if he was going to bed. One of the strange men was kneeling on one knee, making a significant slit in a leg of Teddy's trousers. "'Say, Bob, I wonder if it doesn't take you too far out of your way, if you mind driving round by the house. You see, if anything has happened to Ma, why, the girls will be all up in the air, poor things.' Bob nodded, because he couldn't trust himself to words. And so it was the end. Out in the air it seemed to him as if he had dreamed and waked up. The May night was so exquisite, so hallowing, that the walls of Bitterwell were mellow and enchanted against the dome of stars. Even in these grim courts the scent of growing things was sweet. Driving in the deadest hours of night over the long flat road, he was too tired to think. His imagination didn't try to follow Teddy, because it had become an instinct to spring to the need to carry on. Teddy was behind him. There were other things in front, and his mind was already with them. And yet not actively. After he had slept he would be able to take them up. But just now his main desire was to get home, to bed. Nothing but that would dispel this overweight of emotion. Along the familiar road he drove mechanically. Even Teddy's last request, though it formed an intention, was hardly in his mind. At Bond's corner, where the roads forked, to the right, to Pemberton Heights, to the left, to the bridge that would take him over toward Murillo, he was so nearly asleep that he might have gone straight on homeward, had he not been startled by seeing a man and a woman standing in the middle of the road. He jammed down the surface in emergency base, swinging to the right. The fact that they stood facing him without getting out of his way both amazed him and rendered him indignant. Turning to look at so strange a pair of pedestrians, he saw— Teddy, and his mother. They were not quite on the road, but a little above it. 
Neither were they in the dark, like other things around, but shining with a light of their own. Neither were they shadowy apparitions, but definite, vital, forcible. They were dressed as he had generally seen them, and yet they wore a kind of radiance. The mother's arm was over her boy's shoulder, but Teddy was waving his hand. Smiles were on both faces, on the lips, in the eyes, and somehow in the personality. Bob was not frightened, but he was thrilled. It seemed to him that they stayed long enough to overcome all the doubts of his senses. Though he pressed on the brakes, the car went a number of yards before he could bring it to a standstill. And yet they never left his side. They didn't exactly move. They were only there, living, lovely, sending out love as it had been light, wrapping him round and round. It was so vivid, so much a fact, that when the car stopped and he saw no one there, he was amazed once more to find himself alone. He couldn't drive on at once. He lingered, staring at the spot where they had stood, looking over the wide, dim country, gazing up at the stars in their yearning infinitude. He tried to persuade himself that his own mind was projecting something unreal in itself. But he couldn't throw off the extraordinary happiness the vision left behind it. Before reaching Indiana Avenue, he had decided on a course. If there were no lights in the house, he would drive on homeward. If there were, he would stop. At this hour, in the very early morning, unless something unusual had happened, there would, of course, be none. But there were lights. At sound of his approach, Pansy gave a little silvery yelp. Jenny opened the door before he had time to ring. "'Come in, Bob. I saw your car from the window.' In the living-room, Gussie and Gladys, wearing their dressing-gowns, cried out their relief at seeing him. It was the situation Teddy had foreseen in which they were all up in the air. As usual, Gladys was the spokesman. "'Oh, Bob, we're so glad to have you. We didn't know what to do. Mama!' A sob stopped her, but Jenny was more calm. mamma has gone, Bob. Gussie went into her room about half-past ten to take her the glass of milk we always put by her bed, and she was asleep. They gathered round him as if he formed their rallying point. He took Jenny and Gussie each by the hand. Gladys held his coat by the lapel. "'You're not sorry, any of you, are you? She wanted to go, and she's gone in the sweetest of ways.' "'She won't have to hear about Teddy,' Gussie wept. "'That's a comfort, anyhow.' Gladys laid her head against Bob's breast. "'No, but Teddy'll have to hear about her.' Bob saw the opportunity. "'No, Gladys. Teddy will not have to hear about her.' He let this sink in. "'Teddy knows.' It was some seconds before Jenny and Gussie released his hands and Gladys let go his lapel. When they did, they moved away silently. Gussie dropped on her knees at the arm of a big chair, bowing her head and crying quietly. Jenny, a slim figure with hands behind her back, walked down the length of the room, staring at the curtained window towards Indiana Avenue. Gladys stood off, looking at Bob, nodding her head sagely, as she said, "'I thought that's what it meant when he didn't want us to come. He liked it better without saying good-bye. So we all do.' She gave a big, sudden sob, controlling herself as suddenly. "'We're going to carry on, Bob. We're not going to show the white feather.' There was another big sob, with another successful effort to keep it back. "'We're not going to show the white feather, any of us, just to please you.' "'Thank you, Gladys. It will please me. "'But there's something that pleases me more. "'I'd like to tell all three of you about it.' "'Jenny turned round from the window, coming back down the room. "'She was pale, but she didn't cry. "'Gussie dried her eyes and was struggling to her feet "'when Bob laid his hand on her shoulder. "'No, Gussie, stay where you are. "'I'll sit down here.' "'He dropped into the chair. "'You come on this side, Jenny. "'That is... But Gladys had already crouched at his feet, while Jenny, balancing Gussie, sank beside the other arm of the chair. Pansy sprang up to her place on his knee. 
He told them about Teddy and his mother, about Teddy's vision and his own. I don't say I know what to make of it. I'm not at all sure that we're obliged to explain that sort of thing, unless we're scientists or psychologists. It seems to me that when beauty and comfort flash on us at a time of great need, we're at liberty to take them for what they seem to be, even if we don't understand them. As his hand lay on the arm of the chair, Jenny kissed it again and again. It was the first spontaneous affection she had ever shown him, and though it moved him with a stirring strange and fundamental, he felt that with the awesome things so fresh in their minds, the time had not yet come to respond to it. It was one more impulse to gather force by being restrained a little longer. It isn't as if this thing stood alone. A great many people have had experiences like it. They may be no more than fancy, just as some people say. But I do know this, that by what he saw, Teddy was helped to do what he had to do. And that for me... Yes, Bob, Gladys pleaded, what was it for you? Something real, and assuring, and beautiful, and comforting, and glorious. He uttered the word slowly, as if selecting his terms. More than that, he went on, it was something that's given me a happiness I can't describe, but which I should like to share with you, which perhaps I shall be able to share with you, as we get to know one another better, and time goes on. The little snub-nosed face, something like Pansy's, was lifted to him adoringly. "'Are we going to be your very own, Bob?' "'Yes, laddies, my very own.' End of chapter 28Chapter twenty nine of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty nine. How can we be your very own when you don't know anything about me? Gussie and Gladys had gone up to get some sleep. Jenny was crouched, not against the arm of the chair as before, but against Bob's knee. Still pressing back the instincts of his passion, he did no more than let his hand rest lightly on her hair. "'I know this much about you, Jenny, that after all we've gone through, we're welded together. Nothing can separate us now, no past, nor anything you could tell me. Is that why you don't want to know?' "'I don't want to know now. That's all I'm saying. Things are settled for us. They're settled and sealed. It's what we get out of so much that's terrible— that we don't have to debate that point any more. We may have to adapt ourselves to conditions we don't know anything about as yet, but it will be a matter of adapting, not of cutting loose. What should I be if I were to cut loose from you and the girls now, Jenny? What should you be if you were to cut loose from me? She pressed her cheek against his knee. We'd die, she said simply. So there you are. You know what you mean. I'd die too. That is, we mightn't die outwardly, but something would be so killed in us that we'd never be really alive again. So why try to pull apart what life has soldered into one? But you don't know. Yes, I do. I know more than you think. I know that the things that trouble you are dreams, and that our life together is reality. You'll tell me the dreams as we go on, a little at a time, and I'll show you that you've waked from them. I know there are things to explain, but I know, too, that there's an explanation. But I don't want the explanation yet. I'm I'm too tired, Jenny. I want to rest. And I can't rest unless we all rest together, you with me and the girls with us, in a kind of quiet acceptance of the things that have happened, and in the—I oh, hardly know how to express it—but in the tranquillity of love. I wonder if you'll understand me. She murmured. I don't know that I understand you, Bob, quite, but I do, I, I do love you. It's, it's different from love, it's, it's more, it's like, like melting into you. 
that's love, Jenny. It isn't anything indifferent. It's just love. But you're so big. And you're so little, so we. Don't you see? That's it. That's the compensating thing in nature. It's because we're different that we need each other and complete each other. I can't explain it to you as you'd explain a sum in arithmetic. I only know. You complete me, Jenny. As I've said so often, you're the other half of me. And you're all of me, and more. Then since we know that, why not do as I said? Just rest a while. We've come up to our next ledge, as I was trying to explain to you a few months ago. I know we can camp here a bit, and if we've had some scratches in the climb, we can talk of them by and by. We've learned the one big thing we needed to know, that we belong together, that we can't be torn apart. Just for now, why can't that be enough for us? It will be enough if you will let me tell you that, that what I've said about Hubert wasn't wasn't as bad as perhaps you think. I don't say it mightn't have been. It, it was as bad as that in, in intention. But the magic cloak of your love, which you used to write about, seemed to hang round me. That's the only way I can put it. That'll do, Jenny. Don't try to say any more. It's only what, in some way, I can't tell you how, I know already. He knew she was crying. But he let her cry. He would have cried himself, only that since the vision at Bond's Corner he felt this extraordinary happiness. While his reason would have striven to accept the psychologist's explanation, his inner self was convinced of Teddy's delight in beginning his next experiment. He himself was tired, but at peace. Tired, but no longer with a need of sleep, only with a need of being quiet, with a sense of fulfilment. There were tears in her voice as she whispered brokenly, "'Is it wrong, Bob, to feel so so comforted when Mamma is lying upstairs and darling Teddy is?' "'We can't choose the way by which comfort comes to us, Jenny, darling. Things happen which we don't want to have happen, and yet they can work together for good if we only give them half a chance.' He was interrupted by the loud, sweet thrilling of a thrush. Jenny raised her head in surprise, looking at the pallid shimmer through the curtained window. "'It's day.' They were both on their feet. "'Yes, Jenny, it's day, again. Let's go out.' They went as they were, bareheaded like children, into the purity of morning. Pansy, disturbed by the many strange auras in the house, scampered ahead of them, relieved by the escape. The street was still empty, asleep clean, with every lawn patch and garden bed drenched with dew. Only the birds and the flowers were waking to the light. Turning toward the cliffs and the river, their talk became more practical. Bob suggested to Jenny what his father had suggested to him. Mr. Huntley was going to Europe in connection with some new European loan. The proposal was that Bob should go with him. The trip might last six months. "'And if I go,' he added, "'we both go. "'We should have a few weeks to settle things finally here. "'Oh, but, Bob, how could I go and, and leave the two girls? "'They need me more than ever now. "'I'm not only their sister, but their mother.' "'Why shouldn't they come with us? "'I love having them. Six months over there would make a break with what they've been through here. "'And when we come back, Edith has things she's going to suggest.' "'That would be heavenly, Bob, but, but the money?' "'The money's all right. "'In my new job at the bank I've got a bigger salary. five thousand. "'And now that Dad's giving Edith ten thousand a year as allowance, "'he's giving me the same. "'That's a pretty good income to begin with. "'Besides which, Dad, you'll have to know Dad, Jenny, "'he doesn't want me to spare any money while we're, we're passing through this, this crisis. "'And your mother's lovely. I know that.' "'Yes, Mother's splendid, too. "'So's Edith. "'You'll find that they all want want to make up to you and to the girls for—' "'But he didn't say for what, "'because they came to where they saw above the cloud-wrapped city. "'The glory of chrysoprase, turquoise, and topaz 
which precedes the sunrise and takes the breath away. Oh, look! Oh, look! Instinctively, they clasped hands as they stood on the edge of the flowery precipice, watching the cryosprays yellow into saffron and the turquoise melt into sapphire, while the topaz became light. Then, silently, above the wraith-like towers and cubes and battlements, slipped the rim of gold. "'There it is, Bob.' He drew her to him, holding her close. "'Yes, there it is again, Jenny, always coming back to us. The last time we were here we had only the moonrise. And now it is the sun. The sun!' Her head lay against his shoulder, and as the rim became an orb, the cloud-built vision of Manhattan was touched with flecks of fire. Within its heart lay Broadway, Fifth Avenue, Wall Street, and the Bowery. Shops, churches, brothels and banks, all passions, hungers, yearnings and ambitions, all national impulses worthy and detestable, all human instincts holy and unclean, all loveliness, all lust, all charity, all cupidity, all secret and suppressed desire, all shameless exposure on the housetops, all sorrow, all sin, all that the soul of man conceives of as evil and good. And yet, with no more than these few miles of perspective and this easy play of light, translated into beauty, uplifting, unearthly, and ineffable. End of chapter 29 End of the Empty Sack by Basil King